So what a week it has been. Um, last week, we had the opportunity to walk through Haiti with our missionaries, and we saw the hands, the feet, and the heart of Jesus on full display. And if you were here, you saw all of that, and you also saw a mini fireside chat. My very simple message was to own the direction that we're going, the speed with which we're going, and to show the heart with which I own those things. I showed you all the outline of what I had planned way back, way back, even as far as my interview process, and that hasn't changed. What I asked forgiveness for was the rapid fire nature of the changes that we've undergone. They were just too much for some. And when that happens, too much change, people stop seeing the heart in it. And when they start, stop seeing the heart in it, they just get angry about another change. So I hope, I hope you heard what I said, that I'm hoping to slow things down so that more of us can get comfortable with what we're doing and we can all participate and move forward. That was last week. Now, during the week, there were plenty of people that let me know, either by phone, email, or stopping by, that said, Mark, I just want to be really clear with you. There are going to be some folks that if you don't make any changes until two years from now and make one change on the color of your shirt, people are going to not like that because that's too fast for them. Okay? And, and I understand that. Change comes and acceptance of that at different rates for different folks. Fully get it. And that's why communication becomes essential. Okay? I promise to continue to bore you with direct communication. And I commit to that direct communication. What I need from you is a commitment that you'll communicate directly with me and the leadership of our church as you have questions. Because you're going to have questions. I have questions all the time. And that's why I go to those trusted advisors. My goal today is simply to restate the direction we're headed and talk about the scripture that we can rest in. We have to make sure we're on the right path, and not just because we say so, but because it is the right path, based in an objective truth, the Bible. So let's consider these truths as road signs or mile markers or, or landmarks that tell us that we can know, not just think, not just feel, but know to the best of our ability that we're going in the right direction. Now please listen carefully to see if there are any questions that you have. Please write them down if you do. If you don't agree with the direction that we're going or the destination that we're going to, well, that's something pretty important. We should probably talk about that now versus a year or two or three from now. So let's begin with the end in mind. I don't know about you, but anytime I get in the car, we're going on a journey, I try to figure out where I'm going first before I pull the car out of the driveway. Right? You want to know where you're going first so you think about the destination itself. So this is where we'd like to end up. The most God-honoring church we can be. That is point A, B, C, D, point one, two, three. That is the alpha, the omega. That is everything that a church should focus on being. A church that honors God. Now, if you disagree with that, then please make note, because that's a significant disconnect from everything else that I'm about to talk about. I'm not saying you're wrong if you like to end up in a different place. I'm just saying that we should know that on the front end. Because if you want to end up in Chicago, and I'm planning a trip to St. Louis, we, we have a big disconnect there. Right? And, and better to know it now before we pull out of the garage either. I invite you to open your Bibles now to 1 John chapter 5. That's not the Gospel of John. That's towards the back of the Bible now called 1 John. There's 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Now, um, we're just going to read the first five verses. If you don't have your Bibles with you, you'll find them in the rows there. But we're going to be looking at some Scripture today. So it's probably a good idea that even if you don't normally... Look that you, you do look now. 
Now I'm going to get there myself. 1 John 5. Now I'm reading out of the New American Standard. Uh, you might be reading out of the NIV, the ESV. Um, it matters not. The message is still the same. 1 John chapter 5. Starting in verse 1. So 1 John chapter 5, starting in verse 1. Now you realize this is written by John, the same John that wrote the gospel. He's known as the love guy. He's the one whom Jesus loved. He's rooted in love. He talks about love. He connects through love. He is about love, 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 love. So right here in chapter 5, He's talking about what happens when we fellowship really well together. So let's take a look. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And whoever loves the Father loves the child born of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe His commandments. Let me stop there. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe His commandments. There's a couple of things that we're to do there. To love God and observe His commandments. To know that He loves us first and we return that love to Him. How do we do that? We observe His commandments. Verse 3, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. For those that know Him and love Him, we want to honor Him by doing things His way. Verse 4, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world but He who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. That word victory is really cool. Do you know what that is in Greek? That word victory? Nike. Nike is that word. And it meant a lot in Greek culture because they were a competitive culture. The whole New Testament is written in Greek. They identified with the Greeks. This idea of victory that's overcome the world. Our faith gives us that kind of victory over the world. So, I've got a question for you. In the first three verses there, we say that we love God if we keep His commandments. How do you bring honor to the head of your family? Think of your family structure for a minute. Grandpa, Pop, Uncle Charlie, whoever it might be. How do you bring honor to them? You normally try to follow what they tell you to do, right? The way they're leading the family, the way they're guiding you to be. You praise them when you can. You spend time in their presence. That's kind of exactly here what, what God's calling us to. How do you bring honor to your entire family you spend time with them you honor what they honor you value what they value you all gather around certain core principles and core values you you live in a manner that reflects their love for you you live in a manner that reflects their love for you how do, we, how do we get there? How do we get there? Well, that part is coming a little bit later. Let's figure out how we'll know when we've gotten there. What does a God-honoring church look like? By the way, by the way, I'm not saying we're not a God-honoring church. As a matter of fact, I'm going to tell you why we are one. Let's just make sure we identify those things that are important to know that we are. Okay? Okay? Let's look at what a church is. The Bible tells us this, and I've got this definition for you. The Bible tells us this, and I, I, I culled this from a number of places. It tells us that it's a gathering of members of a body that are committed to love each other, live out the gospel, affirm each other 
disciple each other, serve each other, and share that love with the folks that don't know the good news of why we live this way. We live like we love because we have been loved so well. Is that a good summary? We live like we love because we have been loved so well. Can you say that with me? We live like we love because we have been loved so well. Who's loved us so well? Who's loved us so well? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit has loved us that well. And we need to live in that love with one another. So, what is the church's purpose in living that way? What's the church's purpose? I've got three that jump out of the text of the Bible. The first one is to worship God. First purpose of a church is to worship God. Now, would you, I'll tell you what, you don't have to turn here, but we're going to look at Colossians 3. Now, if you want a full picture here, go to Colossians 3, verse 5, and read that whole section. I'm just going to focus on verses 16 and 17. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Worship. What did we just do? What did we just do here? What did Ward lead us through? Hymns and spiritual songs. What are psalms? Psalms are songs written there. As a matter of fact, you see musical notes in there. They're songs and they're prayers. So we, as a church, are supposed to come together and do that as a body of believers. Consider the link between Ephesians 1 and what we just read. I'm going to turn. You can. You're welcome to join me in Ephesians 1 if you like. Remember, God eats popcorn. Right? Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Ephesians 1. I'm going to start in, in verse 11 just to give a little context. It says, also we have obtained an inheritance. You, we. Here's Paul talking to the church in Ephesus, but he's talking about us as a collective body. He says, we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to his, God's, purpose who works all things after the counsel of his will. To the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. That we would praise God because of what he's done for us. That we would sing songs and hymns and we would pray and praise Him. Here's the conclusion of those two together is we would, now that we've obtained the inheritance, display God's character. We would display God's character. That's what we're called to do in worshiping Him. Display God's character. Let's flip over to, you're in Ephesians now, let's, let's, we're on a roll. Let's go to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, verse 15. Now here Paul is writing again to Ephesus in this section. He's talking about, look, here's all this great stuff, but be aware of some of this other stuff. You can fall into this. Be aware. I'm giving you a warning here. He says, therefore, all the stuff that he just said, therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. What is the will of the Lord? Don't get drunk with wine, for that's dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Become drunk in the Spirit, speaking to one another in, what did it say before in Colossians? 
in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Just like in Colossians, what is our purpose to worship God in this way? Notice, not only does he say worship God, but be subject to one another. Now, if you go on in that section, by the way, you want to learn something about how husbands and wives should treat one another and what they should be rooted in. If you're struggling at all in any way in your marriage or you want to enrich your marriage or your dating life or your whatever, pick up right there, but don't pick up in Ephesians 5.22. Start in Ephesians 5.21 because that's where it really all starts. Be subject to one another. And then read through to the end of Ephesians 5. It's a beautiful treatise on relationships. Okay, first purpose, to worship God. What's the second purpose? To nurture. Nurture. I'm going to look at Colossians again. I'm, I'm jumping back. To, by the way, in case you didn't know this, um, Colossians and Ephesians are sister letters. They're, they're sister books. So they were probably passed around the same group of churches. Okay, so you'll notice that there's a tie-in for the both of them. So, by the way, both written by Paul, of course. Um, Colossians. <clears throat> I'm going to start Colossians chapter 1. I'm going to start in verse 24. This is about nurturing. Colossians 1, 24. Now I rejoice in my suffering for your sake, and in my flesh... I do my share on behalf of his body. So this is Paul saying, hey, I'm happy to suffer for you because it's for Christ that I really do this, which is the church. It says, I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Of this church, I was made minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the Word of God. That is, the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to His saints. Who are His saints? You are. Yes, Jimmy, yes. You are His saints. The things that are hidden away in Scripture that had been hidden away are revealed in Jesus Christ, but also in God's Word that those of us that are called to preach are supposed to just illuminate for you. We don't make the stuff up. We're not supposed to be about smoke and mirrors. We're supposed to be about going, hey, look at this. You might not have seen this this way before, but here's what's really going on. Okay, I was gonna take us all the way to 29. Where the heck did I end up? I get so excited, I don't know what I'm doing anymore. Okay, verse 26, that is the mystery which has been, oh, I already read that. Okay, verse 27, to whom God willed, to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. Brothers and sisters, there's a to-do list there. There's a to-do list there to nurture every single man, woman, and child to be complete in Christ so that when we show up on the doorstep and we go, hey God, I'm here. I'm as complete as I could get. I know that sin has marred me. I know that sin has torn pieces out of me. But I did all I could. I really worked at it. I didn't work at it because I thought I'd gain more love from you. I worked at it because you called me to. Because you knew what was good for me. <coughs> Pair that back with Ephesians. And again, you find, I'm going to read it to you. Don't, you don't need to go there. Um, I just want you to hear that this is about nurturing, nurturing, nurturing. Ephesians 4. We looked at Ephesians 5 before, but I'm going to read it in context for you. Just three verses. 
It says, and he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Is there any question in anybody's mind that what a church is supposed to do is worship God but in worshiping God, we nurture one another to know God fully. Only because he calls us to. Why does he call us to do that? Is it so we'd have a big checklist that we could check off? No, because he knows the more you know him, the more you understand his character, the more you radiate his character, the more you're able to reflect that love that you receive from God. Why is that so darned important? Well, Colossians is going to tell us, but I'll tell you what, that's why it's so darned important. So that you can share God's love with others. Why does he want you to root so much your being in him? It's just so everybody can see it. Because you'll reflect it the more you know it. What do we say about families? Right? How do, how do you become part of a family? You sign up for what the family believes in, and you reflect the nature of that family. We all know families, right? Oh, that's the athletic family. Oh, that's the, uh, the family that has all the kids over to their place all the time. Oh, that's the family that has all of the, the, the trampoline in the backyard and um, they have all the foster kids. And then this family is the holy family. We all know holy families, don't we? Oh, and this is the family who, well, we're not going to talk about those are the Giganis. Mm. Okay, we're not going to talk about them. We all know those families. We <laughs> reflect the character of that family. All God is saying to you is, hey, brothers and sisters, my children, God says, I want, you to, I want you to worship me. I want you to nurture each other and for the purpose of sharing that with everybody else. My vision has not changed at all. You heard Pastor Justin talk about Matthew 28. This God-honoring church, this vision that I had for this has not changed at all since my interview, to help us attain the biblical calling and purpose of a God-honoring church. Now, how do we know when we've gotten to be a God-honoring church? I got a news flash for you. We are one. We are one. Anybody thinks that holding up this, this mirror to us is a condemnation? It's not. It's an affirmation that we are a God-honoring church. But I want to I want to read something to you out of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12 and you might want to write this one down. You can go back to it later on if you like. Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us whoa wait a minute you mean because we're so nurturing to one another here and we have set aside the sin and all those tough things that go on in a church we love each other so much that we need to endure verse 2 fixing our eyes on Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of God, the right hand of the throne of God. And the last one, verse 3 says, For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. As I said last week, brothers and sisters, we have not arrived. I haven't arrived. None of us has arrived. What we're called to do is continue the race toward what? Toward a God-honoring church. Remember, it's a completed picture. 
Now, what are the welcome signs that you get as you're coming up to the exit on that road that you're going to get off on at that God-honoring church place? Here's just a couple of them. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 9 through 12. Listen carefully. Now, as to the love of the brethren, that's you, each other, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. For indeed, you do not practice it toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia, but we urge you, brethren, to excel still more and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and attend to your own business and work with your hands just as we commanded you, so that you will behave properly toward outsiders and not be in any need. In other words, love each other so much, so much, that it just spills out on everybody else. That's how you're going to know that you're in that God-honoring place. And you know what? We have some of that, but we need more. That's what he's telling these guys. Now, if he's telling them that, we need it too. 1 Corinthians 12, two verses here. Um, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. A church that is God-honoring has members that are living the good news so much and so well with each other that they have so much excess. It shoots out everywhere. These are the people we're around that just can't help but get God on you. You know these people? Like it splashes out of them. You just can't help it. They spatter you with it all over the place. Okay, you just hear it, feel it, know it. It breeds and it feeds upon itself in a friendship, in a marriage, and certainly in a church. And you know what's really cool about us? Sounds conceited. But what's really cool about us is I get to see the visitor cards. And I get to talk to some of the visitors. And you know what the visitors say? Wow, you guys love so well when people walk in the door. I came the first few times. Oh, man, I felt like I was home here. Okay, that's a phenomenal thing that we do. We do that really, really well. I kind of think of it like, well, like a first date, right? Think back to your first date. You want to put your best foot forward. You want to, hi there, yes, thank you. Oh, let me get the door for you. Mm, yes. Mm, oh, no, no, you don't have to pay. I'll pay. Right? And you're on P's and Q's, you're minding your P's and Q's, right? The whole thing. You want it to stay that way forever, don't you? I see all the wives going like this and all the husbands going like this, right? No, that, you want it to stay that way forever. But you know, once you get to know people a bit, they're your friends. Maybe you get married to them. Things change. Guys, I'm a pastor. I've been a pastor for a long time. And I'll tell you what, I've done more than my share of marriage counseling. And I'll say this about married people. They will say things to one another that you would not say to your worst enemy. You certainly wouldn't say to your friends. Okay? People say things. What's, what's the adage? We always hurt the ones we love. And we always hurt the ones we love the most. The most. What we strive for as we run the race is a deep and abiding love that counteracts our fallen nature. Because we have a tendency to do that. We know we do. I see it all day. We have a tendency, so we need to be aware of it. We need to admit it. We need to say, okay, so we're going to try to abide in Christ to counteract that. Because that's a natural thing. Natural, man-made, sinful. We're going to try to counteract that with Christ as best we can. God redeemed us and loves us so much that he gave us his son. And you know what? He gave us us. I want you to take just a moment and look around the room right now. Look to your left and look to your right. That person to your left and your right, God gave you them. Yes, God gave you them. Some of you are going, oh no. Couldn't he have chosen someone else? No. Hey, he gave us us to be the greatest witness to the world until he returns. So look, if we know that this on the right-hand side is the destination, 
and we're striving to exhibit the characteristics that are associated with being the most God-honoring, expressive church that we possibly can, how do we get there? Well, this is what the leadership of our church challenged me with. They said, Mark, we agree with what you've laid out. I talked about this last week, but what's the A, B, C, and D of getting there? Okay, so knowing that over here is our destination, right? We're going to St. Louis or Chicago over here. And these are the welcome signs. These are the things that are saying, 10 miles to Chicago or St. Louis. Welcome to the, land, to the Windy City or, well, you know, you know you're getting close when kind of signs. Well, now let's go all the way back to where we're pulling out of the garage. The whole shooting match starts with salvation. It begins right there with salvation. We're saved because at some point in our lives, we've professed with our mouths and believed in our hearts that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and He died for our sins. To know that someone's saved, the Bible indicates that person must be living a regenerate life. Just saying a prayer and not living a regenerate life is akin to being three out of the four soils in Mark 4. Young adults, where do we find the soils? In Mark 4. We find it in Mark 4. If you'd like to turn there, you're welcome. I'm just going to read this for us. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mark chapter 4, right at the beginning. Can't miss it. Jumps right out at you. Verse 3. Listen to this. Behold, the sower went out to sow, and as he was sowing, some seed fell before the road, and the birds came and ate it up. Who are the birds? Satan. So Satan gathers up the seed. Death. Verse 5. Other seed fell on the rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of soil. And after the sun had risen, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. Second seed that falls on that soil, that's dead too. What's the third one? Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. Third, that's dead too. It's as good as dead, because nothing good's coming out of it. It got choked out. Three dead. You only have one left. Other seeds fell into the good soil, and as they grew up and increased, they yielded a crop and produced 30, 60, and 100 fold. Just saying a prayer and not living a regenerate life is akin to being three out of those four soils. Hey, many professions are made, but we have to help people root in the rich soil of the truth of the real gospel. That's what we do when we nurture here in church. It starts there at salvation. It's a tragedy to see people that are convinced that a prayer years ago with no change that's sustained and visible is going to lead to salvation. The Bible's clear that that's not so. That it's a both and. And I'm not trying to offend anybody because look, I got plenty of family that's professed Christ and is living way off the beam. See, but it's clear in the Bible that you need to profess and then live that way. Otherwise, you're those three soils. You're dead. Profess and live. That's how you can tell that your salvation is real. Take a look at 1 John. 1 John. Go back to 1 John if you, if you want to. If you don't, I'm going to read it to you. 1 John chapter 2. Starting in verse 3. By this we know that we've come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I've come to know him, Jesus, right, and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him, but whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. 
By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Beloved, I'm not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you've had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. On the other hand, I'm writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. That's the true light of Jesus. The one who says he is in the light, in Jesus, and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him, but the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Now, in contrast, if you wanted to, you could look in chapter 4, and I'm just going to read three verses here. Verse 14. We have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Can I get an amen? amen? Yes. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him and He in God. Can I get an amen? amen. Yes. We've come to know and have believed the love with which God has for us. God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God and God abides in Him. Could that be any clearer? Right? It's a, it's a two-way street right there. God in Him and Him in God. Now, why does John write this? Verse 17 tells us. And this is a beautiful piece of Scripture right here. Listen. By this, love is perfected with us so that, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. What's John saying? John's saying, brothers and sisters, if this is true of you, you are saved. Act like it. Live in it. Relax in it. Have confidence. When you walk up on the day of judgment, you don't have to walk up going, oh man, I screwed up. Fiery place. Burning. Oh, God's going to cast me down. You don't have to have that. Now, you don't want to walk up all cocky. Where's my place in heaven? Shove over there, Jesus. I need a seat up here. No. But you can walk up with confidence. If, if this is you, if you abide in Christ, if you are keeping his commandments, if you are striving to, to run the race and to complete the race well, then have confidence. You're known, you're loved, and you're safe. Out of that confidence, the three things to worship God, to nurture each other in that truth in the gospel, and then to share that with everyone else is what we're called to do. Don't you want everyone to know that truth? And everyone to be able to be that confident now that we've already won, we can't lose. We can't lose. Now, assuming that we in this room are Christians, we need to know we are, live like we are, structure to support us, knowing and living, to affirm our walk, to correct it when it gets off the road. It's that simple and that complex all at the same time. We're going to look at that in part two of the plan next week about how we do that remember last week when I said we have an outreach plan we do we do we have an outreach plan and we're gonna dovetail that with the message next week please be here next week if you can because this is how we're gonna reach out into the community and what we're gonna do and what we've been what we've been aching for I think for a long time I know I have, to go out and just tell people how much we love them. Tracy and I, Debbie, we got an opportunity to do that in Haiti, and people came into the kingdom that otherwise would not have known the Lord. Sixteen children, two adults, just from walking around. We want to be able to do that here. Okay. Now, the first few weeks of our outreach plan 
involves praying for the communities that we're going to go out and engage in the coming months. I'd like you to take some time to pray for those communities. I want to ask you to do something that's very focused. Now, that looks great on my computer, and it looks horrible up here. Okay, see that big black line that runs through? It looks like the, the screen's cracked or something, right? That's 460. That's 460. Okay, this is a map that's about a five mile radius from right about there, which is where we are. We're in the center right here. Okay, and there are tons of squiggly lines, and you can see some of them. Tons of squiggly lines of roads that emanate throughout the, the, the well, throughout the whole map. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do during our time of invitation. We're going to take a few minutes, and what I want you to do is I want you to choose a street that you know five miles from here, anywhere within a five-mile radius of here. I don't care what street it is. It doesn't matter if it's your street or somebody else's street. Get that street name in your head. And if you say, well, I don't know any streets here. You know Phoenix Mill? You know Dickerson Mill? What else? Thaxton School Road? Magnolia. Say it louder. Magnolia. Magnolia. You got to say it that way too. Magnolia. Mm -hmm. Okay, what else? Who else do we know? What other roads? Say it. Cobb Mountain Road? Wheatland Road? Nestor Road? Okay. Don't care what road it is. Five miles, somewhere five miles here. What we're going to ask you to do for the next few minutes, we're going to click a few of the lights down. We're going to ask you to pray for that road. We're going to ask you to pray for their hearts to be opened, for their minds to be clear, for eyes that are able to hear, uh, to see, for ears that are willing to hear. Picture what those folks might be doing right now. Right now. They're not here. Picture what they might be doing right now. And pray that God might tug on their heart. That he might do something different in their heart. Pray that they'll be receptive at some time in the future to our invitation to Fall Fest or here to Thaxton to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. That's all we're asking you to pray for. Pick the name of a road right now. Try to picture the people on it. Picture the road if you know what it is. If you know people on there, it's fine. Think about them. Picture what they're doing, and please pray for those things for them. We're going to take just a few minutes as we click the lights down. And Abigail, as, would you join me in prayer? By the way, if you want to join our church, know Jesus Christ, or be baptized, come on up here. I'll be praying also with you.